I'm, uh, I'm Jack Ross, and as uh, one of the few other people in this room who is uh, something other than an anarcho-capitalist, I'd uh, like to ask, can everyone hear me? Uh, I'd like to ask, uh, yes, I, I'd like to ask your thoughts on the uh, failure of the, uh, of the liberal intellectuals in particular if you've read the essay by Tony Jute, Bush's Useful Idiots, which I would recommend to anyone here who hasn't read it. If, and what? I haven't read it either. I'll go read it. What, what is are, your question? But what, what are your thoughts on the uh, failure, failure of, of liberal intellectuals? Well, the biggest failure of liberal intellectuals is that they endorsed the Cold War and its you know, simplicity and its... Uh, uh, in a cowardly way, in an opportunistic way. And, you know, I still think of Daniel Ellsberg as a liberal. I don't know what he thinks of himself. But, you know, we had good liberals standing up, stand up, you know. Uh, there just weren't too many. It turns out liberals, when they get into government, are opportunistic to the same degree as conservatives or anyone else. In fact, I've met a few people at this convention who tell me they work for government and they're libertarians. You know, uh, so, uh, you know, we live in a society in which opportunism and careerism and you know uh, making out is a pretty important thing, and I think that um, basically liberalism went along with uh, power; it didn't withstand it. And I, I'm not going to put everybody in, in that camp. The, the other thing that happened to liberalism is probably not germane to the subject of this whole conversation, but uh, the people who write and cover things and everything don't tend to see things and whether they're conservatives or they're liberals from the point of view of the other. And a lot of the gut economic issues, whether we're talking about the ripping off of undocumented workers or we're talking about screwing taxpayers who can't afford or so forth, are not felt by politically empowered people, whether they're liberals or conservatives, in the same way they are felt by the other. And so there's very little reporting of how the state affects people's lives. And uh, I would say that's the big cop-out. That, uh, you know, it, didn't, it doesn't really matter at the end of the day what people tell you that they believe in or what church they go to. In fact, if they don't follow the rule of caring about the, the more vulnerable people in the society and the people who don't have a voice and the people who can't spend a lot of time covering things, which is, the, is the, what generally happens, they will betray them. So that's it. Everyone just agrees with me or no? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Here. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering how you felt about uh, new uh, young people who go into journalism. Uh, are they interested in becoming investigative reporters and to try to find out the truth, or are they just buckle under and hey, well, I've got a good job and don't want to really rock the boat? Yeah. Let me also take issue with that previous. Uh, first of all, I have to preface this by saying that uh, I, I I think there are a few more admirable people in the world than. Uh, the speaker who preceded me. Uh, however, I disagree with this general comment that's made about the state of education of young people. I, I teach at USC. We're a very good school. I have, I don't know, over 500 students a year, and they're as sharp as any group of young people I've ever met in the course of my life. I, I just don't buy into, into the general thing they don't know. And what they don't know, they can learn very quickly thanks to the internet incredibly easy. For instance, I show Oliver Stone's movie Nixon and I bring John Dean in. Yes, they've never heard of John Dean because why? Because we're focused on the SATs and this and this and this thing and they don't really know what Nixon did and they don't know what Watergate was about but we have this movie that Oliver made and uh, suddenly I've got John Dean there and he's played by a famous actor in the movie so he's got their attention and I can tell you by the end of that three hour class they know more than their parents do about Watergate. Because right there on their Wi-Fi's, on their laptops, they're checking out everything they can find. And so when I think of the state of, of, of youth today, I think the failure is with the media, with the political leadership. You know, I had a lot of young students who worked for John Kerry. Not too many worked for Bush. Uh, you know, because they saw him as the frat guy who was cruising. Uh, but they worked for, and they were betrayed by Kerry. I'll never forget the moment when, when, when Bush said, Knowing what you know now, would you have voted for the war? And Kerry said yes. Instead of saying no, you lied to the Senate, you lied to the people, of course I wouldn't vote for it. And I just remember how the air just went out of these kids. They were out there working. So I agree with what 
you know, some sort of, if its choice is just working for opportunistic candidates, forget it. It's just, it will increase cynicism. Uh, as far as young journalists, you know, I don't want to, I don't like to put down journalists, because journalists are, a, can, uh, well, I should have time, are very often a brave group. Uh, particularly when they go for, cover things like Iraq, or, you know, uh, people, I mean, a lot of them get killed and injured and so forth, so I, I'm not going to take anything away from that. Where they tend not to be brave, not only tend not to, where they become abject cowards is in their own building. They sail out of the building. I don't care whether it's the LA Times, the New York Times, whatever. They'll take on that CEO. They'll take on a dictator somewhere. But you ask him, what's going on in your own building? Why was that story killed? Why was that person fired? Why was this decision made? Why don't we cover those things? And they become like little church mice. And it's like criminology. I don't know, I think this one is closer to the editor, I think this happened, I hear this story, and they whisper, and they look in the tea leaves. So, so the big problem with journalism is, is you know, uh, A.J. Liebling, you know, a great media critic for the New Yorker once wrote, you know, said, uh, freedom of the press is guaranteed only to those who own one. <laughs> and and uh, the media, they will not do a good job of covering their own ownership, the problems of media concentration, uh, the pressures on it, and again, I applaud the internet, which I happen to think is the great liberating, saving aspect of American life. It's not perfect, there's a lot of crud on it, and a lot of garbage and everything else, but, but you know, damn it, you know, Mark Twain said a lie gets halfway around the world before the truth puts its pants on. Now with the internet, it takes the truth only, uh, what, a year? Uh, you know, um, so I, I would say for young, young journalists, I agree with what Karen said before that, that uh, there's the curiosity, there's the concern, uh, and I think they're gonna come through. I, 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 don't, I don't go for old fogeyism ever. I don't think the 60s were great. You know, uh, I, I don't think that the best generation was in World War II. Uh, you know, I don't think the gold war to youth, to pick closer to home, were all so marvelous. Uh, you know, I, I think uh, we, we kind of glorify uh, the past. Daniel Ellsberg can tell you, because I interviewed him when he was in the middle of the Pentagon Papers thing, and he got damn little support from his old friends. You know, here was the guy doing the obviously correct, courageous, clear thing to do, right? And you could look, where did they all scatter for cover? How many really came to his defense? How many really supported him? And this guy was not some pinko pacifist, you know? He, he was a, a vet, he was a gun toter, you know? He, he had a, supported war. And, and what he, his message was just, hey, here's the truth, read it. Look at it, no one ever said it wasn't the truth. No one ever said it wasn't accurate, it was a bad history. And I remember those days when he was a very lonely figure. And it looked like he was gonna to go to jail for a hell of a long time if Nixon had his way. And I don't recall a long parade of people from the establishment, liberal or conservative, stepping up to defend him. So when people talk to me about the good old days, I don't recall them, and I think this group does just as good a job. And as I say, on the internet, our website is put out by 25-year-olds, and they're great. And we have no shortage of people trying to apply for the jobs, you know. And if you guys got some companies and want to advertise there, you'll help make it a better, <laughs> uh, better business model. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Any others? Or is that we it? have time for one more, one more question. Speaking of the good old days, I seem to remember um, another country that was attacked, that had never attacked us, and uh, it was all based on a bunch of lies about genocide. It was called Serbia. Um, where did you stand on that war? You know, I'll have to Google it. Um, <laughs> I, I'm serious, you know, um, I, I, I think, I think I was, uh, I was certainly, I wrote, I know I wrote, uh, opposed to the idea that somehow uh, suddenly the Croatians and the Albanians and everybody were saints and the Serbians were monsters because I remember that the Serbians were the ones who fought against Hitler and I remember that uh, others were willing to be concentration camp guards and so forth. So I always have had, I, I would not go along with the demonization uh, of one side or another in that and uh, I was very, conf you don't want to hear a long lecture on Yugoslavia, but, but you know, uh, I, the reason I said I would have to Google it is I've said dumb things and I've written dumb things in my life. And it's possible that, you know, this might fall into that category. I don't think so.